Recording in progress. Okay, uh, going to go ahead and call the uh, legislative session for the Board of County Commissioners uh, to order for uh, uh, Tuesday, December 13th. Let the record reflect that Commissioners uh, Kearns and French are present and Commissioner Cooney is traveling on county business and will not be joining us. Uh, we're going to start out with um, uh, our open public forum, and this is an opportunity for folks to uh, share any comments uh, with the board on any items not on our agenda. So we will be taking the items on the agenda later for public comment, but for any item that's not on the agenda, anybody who would like to share any comments with the board, now is the time to do so. And uh, to uh, do so, just uh, come forward to the microphone. We will ask you to fill out one of the yellow slips that uh, uh, provides a name and address so that we can uh, uh, perfect the record uh, and make sure that we uh, memorialize your, your testimony. So uh, I will uh, ask now for a second call for anybody who would like to provide any testimony. If you are on Zoom, uh, please um, either raise your hand or uh, uh, notify uh, or a person in control of the Zoom that uh, you'd like to speak. Uh, or if you're calling in, uh, press star nine, and that will also let us know that you wanna provide testimony. So third and final call for anybody wanting to provide testimony in the open public forum. Not seeing anybody come forward, we will close the forum and uh, get on with our agenda. First item is our consent agenda. And uh, we are making a couple uh, uh, changes to the consent agenda for presentation purposes um, or, or other uh, business. So 4D, D like in Delta, will be taken separately. I'm sorry, 2D, thank you. And, um, and then 2W will be taken separately. And uh, then... Uh, I think that's it for the consent agenda. So um, let's go ahead and have, we're gonna have a staff presentation. No, uh, so let's go ahead and take a motion on those items uh, that we can take on the consent agenda. Hey, Commissioner French, I move that we approve item two, items 2A through items 2CC excluding items 2D and 2W as presented on today's consent agenda. I will second the motion. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passes unanimously. Then uh, getting to item 2D, uh, I will read the item. Uh, this is in the matter of calling an election within Spokane County to be held on Tuesday, November 7th, 2023, and submitting to electors a proposition to impose a two-tenths of 1% sales and use tax equal throughout Spokane County as authorized by RCW 82.14.450, the proceeds to be used by the county, cities and towns within Spokane County for criminal justice, public safety, and behavioral health purposes. So, do we have a motion? Mr. Chair, I move to approve, or Commissioner French, I move to approve item 2D as presented on today's agenda. I will second the motion and look for discussion. Yeah, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kick this off. So we, we've, had, we, we've had several presentations about this, um, uh, several recently, um, many of them over the last decade. Um, this uh, proposal will go to a vote of the of the people, and I will be straight up front that one of the items that we intend to include in the the revenue generated from this is a new jail or co community corrections facility. We have kicked this political football around for over a decade, and it's time uh, for the voters' voices to be heard. Um, you know, we we have. Uh, we, we have have crunched so much data. We have we have just about any piece of data you could ask for when it comes to a jail, a community correction center. We have all of that. We have data 
leading up to a pandemic. We have data through a pandemic. We have data after a pandemic. We have just about every single scenario you can imagine. Um, so, you know, you're, I know I'm, I'm just going to flat out say it right now. You will say, you will hear people that will tell you we do not have enough data to know if we need a new jail. That is a red herring and it is a lie. The current jail that we have is as old as I am. The day it opened, it has been open 24-7, 365 days a year, and the people in there don't want to be there. So they don't treat it very well. The maintenance is extremely expensive. The design is nearly obsolete and very inefficient. It is, a, it is very costly to run. Um, you know, there, there, there are things that we want to do, but we need space to do it. With a new facility, we are gonna be able to completely reimagine our community or our, our, our criminal justice system here. We are going to, if we have room in a new facility, that will allow us to offer programs from GEDs to recreational therapies to job trainings to, uh, uh, to, to bringing over our Head Start to Construction Trades program that's currently operated at Geiger, which is a whole nother story about the condition of that facility that is beginning to fail. We, you know, many of the, the decisions that were made that have got us into this situation were before any of the three of us were on this commission, but we'll be the ones that will step up and we're gonna try to lead us to a solution that will keep our community safe. Um, we, we have to stop the revolving door of folks that are coming into the criminal justice system being immediately released to go out and victimize more people in this community. We need to have a safe community. This is what is going to help us get there. This, the, the, this is much more, I, I have focused a lot on the aspect of a jail and a community correction center in my comments today, but it's much more than that. This will allow us the programming, the, the potential to reduce recidivism. And so that is why that I'm gonna support sending this forward to the voters. You know, there's every elected official says that they support public safety some of us actually mean it. And today, I'm gonna say that this needs to go to the voters and they need to tell us the direction we're headed. Thank you, Commissioner Kearns. Um, so I will um, <clears throat> share with you my perspective on, on this uh, ballot measure. Uh, building a new jail has been uh, part of the conversation uh, ever since I've been on the Board of County Commissioners. Um, but as Commissioner Kearns indicated, this is much more than just building a building or building a new jail facility. This is about investing in our criminal justice system. Uh, and by that, I mean that includes a, a, a reintroduction into the community for folks that have served their time. It means uh, providing appropriate uh, programs for diversion it means providing a safe jail, and what we currently have is functionally obsolescent. It's expensive to operate. We've done an analysis that shows that a new facility will cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $4 million less per year to operate than the current facility does, and a safer environment for not only the inmates, but a safer environment for our corrections uh, officers. So it is time that we put this before the community and then let the community weigh in on what they want because we are servants of the community. And we've been beating this thing up before I got on the board and uh, I'd like to be able to have some direction on this before I leave this board or leave this world. Um, I personally like the sales tax proposition better than the property tax because sales tax uh, is, um, is a method to, to, to garner revenue that not only um, has uh, our local taxpayers contributing to that effort, but also has visitors to the area contributing to that effort. Sales taxes are charged for restaurants, for hotels, for uh, retail opportunities. So as folks visit this community, they will not only be able to enjoy a safe community, but they will also be participants in having to cover the cost of making this community safe. And so I think it's a fairer tax than burdening our property taxpayers with it. Uh, so um, 
And like I said, this is not about just a jail. It's much broader than that. It's about fixing our criminal justice system. We need uh, help with the prosecuting office. We need help with public defenders. We need help with uh, uh, programs, diversion programs, try and keep folks out of the jail that don't need to be in the jail. You know, I'm very proud of the fact that this board uh, invested in partnership with the city of Spokane in a mental health crisis stabilization facility that is currently in operation across the street from us. And that's a facility where when police officers encounter folks on the street that are suffering from either mental illness or substance abuse, instead of ending up going to the jail, they can end up going to a facility that provides treatment. Provides treatment, provides a bed, provides food, provides medicines necessary to stabilize them so that they can return to their lives. Um, they don't need a criminal record, they need help. And I'm proud of the fact that we've got the first of its kind facility in the state. That's a step in the right direction. We need to take the next step, and that is making the other improvements to the criminal justice system uh, that are desperately needed. I never want to see in the newspaper where we have someone that's incarcerated in the jail that's committed suicide because we didn't have a facility that provided us the opportunity to provide supervision. Um, I think we can do better than that. And I hope that the community will join us in this effort and, um, and, and see the wisdom in going forward. So with that, I will call for the question. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record be back. The motion passed unanimously. Then moving on to item 2W, uh, uh, this is in the matter of selecting and approving the firm uh, for housing stability services under the emergency rental assistance uh, to and executing uh, the agreement for housing stability services in conjunction with the emergency rental assistance uh, to program for services through September 30, 2025. Um, Mr. Simmons, is there a presentation on this or are we just taking this motion separately? Uh, we are just taking this separately, commissioners. The uh, item was, was uh, noticed in your agenda. The resolution itself with the backup documents uh, had gotten added yesterday. So therefore, we wanted to have you take it separately, open it for public testimony if there is any, and then uh, vote on it. Thank you, sir. So. Um, with that, I will open up uh, to anybody in the audience who like providing a testimony on item 2W. Again, this was on our agenda but did not have all the backup documentation until yesterday, so we want to provide the public the opportunity to comment. Anybody want to provide comment on item 2W? Third and final call. Say so nobody but come forward. Chair is open to a motion. Commissioner French, move to approve item 2W on today's agenda. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Then that gets us to, oh, and I also wanted to note in our uh, open public forum, we also did not receive any written comments um, uh, uh, to the board. So just want to put that on the record. Then moving on to item uh, three, a through I, uh, we'll start out with item 3A, and I think we have Mr. Matt Zirikor, the county engineer, gonna present on items 3A through 3G. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Matt Zirikor, Spokane County Public Works. Uh, this will be the first of seven public hearings we have on traffic code revisions today. And Ron has the slideshow up. Thank you, Ron. So the first one is considering revising Spokane County Traffic Code number 46.61.4155.4 and removing the 35 mile per hour on Bigelow Gulch and, or I'm sorry, putting in 35 mile an hour. It's currently in the code at 45 mile an hour. And this is right at the intersection of Argonne and Bigelow Gulch and making the speed limit change for obvious safety reasons due to the intersection and the signalized control there. 
And that's all I have on that one. I'll give it back to you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Zirikor. Uh So this is a uh, public hearing item, so I will open up the hearing for anybody in the audience who might provide any testimony on hearing item 3A. So I do have somebody on Zoom or on phone? On the phone. So um, whoever's on the phone, would you please in, uh, introduce yourself and give us your address? Hello, am I on yes. audio there? Yes, go ahead. My name is Richard Burnett. My name is Richard Burnett. My address is 9800 East Bigelow Gulch Road, Spokane, Washington, 99217. Um, I think there might be some confusion here because as the intersection is currently signed, there is a 35 mile an hour sign uh, west of the fire station and it goes clear down to the intersection. And I believe that this, you are requesting the change to make the speed limit 45 miles an hour all the way except up to the last uh, 900 feet before the intersection. Is that correct? I'll go ahead and address that Please. comment. Yeah, a lot of these you'll find are actually currently posted the way we're presenting them, but they're not codified in county code. And to be legal and enforceable, they have to be codified into county code. So a lot of this is actually cleaning up the existing posted speed limits. And also the, the section that the gentleman's referring to from the fire station down to what we're proposing to be 35, we're actually increasing the speed limit on that section up to 45. It's, if you drive it now, since we've redone the roadway, it's uncomfortably slow to drive that section at 35 miles per hour. So one of the next proposals coming up is actually to codify that to, up to 45 miles an hour and change that speed limit. Okay. Well, okay. Um, like maybe I should make my comments all address both of these issues because because they are issues. I'm not certain that uh, that 45 mile an hour speed limit increasing that area to 45 miles an hour is appropriate because that is where the fire station is and and uh, also as you approach the intersection there's a church with the school there and then there's development occurring at the intersection. And uh, the, the gas station and probably new retail businesses. And I think that it would be safer to retain that speed limit from 35 mile an hour prior to the fire station, uh, just because I think that that's appropriate because there are emergency vehicles in that tra traffic, uh, you know, coming from the fire station. And I think it would be uh, much safer. Typically, many drivers, when they see a speed limit of 45 miles, Per hour uh, treated as a 50 to 55 mile an hour per, in speed zone and also traffic enforcement typically doesn't uh, uh, begin enforcement in 45 mile an hour zones until the speed approaches 53 to 55 or my more uh, miles per hour uh, and then I have an additional comment uh, well and I think that you know you're coming downhill from both of those uh, sections and so uh, I think that uh, 35 mile an hour even further to the east of the intersection would be appropriate and one other concern that I really have is is that uh, the truckers that come through there use unmuffled compression brakes as they as, when they get at the top of the hill probably a quarter of a mile or more before the intersection and that's just obnoxious to the people that reside there and people that work in those areas. And I would uh, urge the commissioners and the traffic uh, engineers to uh, put forward a, uh, a proposal to uh, post that as uh, unm unmuffled compression brakes are, are prohibited, similar to that uh, on Argonne. Uh, like I say, I, the, some of the biggest offenders of the, un uh, the compression brakes are the trucks that are carrying uh, materials for the road construction in the area. And it's just obnoxious there. You can't even uh, stand next to a person uh, 10, 10 feet away from you uh, and 30 or 40 feet from the road and understand the conversation as these trucks go by. 
I think that uh, okay. whenever the uh, 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 environmental documents were filed, they said that they were going to address this type of issue and make sure that it wasn't a problem. But uh, okay. I, I think I think that's something that hasn't been followed through on. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, second call for anybody else like to provide any testimony on hearing item 3A. Third and final call. So, I'm going to close the hearing and look to my fellow commissioner for direction. Commissioner French, I move to approve public hearing item 3A as presented by staff. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Then moving on to 3B, uh, consider revising Spokane County Traffic Code number 46.61.2002. Mr. Uh, Zeracor. Uh, thank you, Commissioner French. This next traffic code revision is for removing stop signs on Farwell Road and adding a stop sign or codifying it on Mayfair and also codifying the one at Addison Road in Farwell. You can see the exhibit here. This location, if you're familiar with it, is in North Spokane. It's at the Wandemere Shopping Center. And that Farwell Road is the new development kind of directly west of the Highway 2 there. I'm sorry, Highway 395. And this really is just Mayfair and Farwell used to be a four-way stop. It doesn't need to be anymore. This is the location of our old corral pit, if you're familiar with that and that pit no longer is active, it is being redeveloped and there's likely to be additional traffic revisions at the time that they finish their development and build their new roads in there. So this is just cleaning up what we have for now, knowing that there are likely future changes to come. Okay, thank you, any questions? Very good, so uh, this also is a hearing item, so I'll open up the hearing uh, for item 3B. If anybody would like to provide any testimony, you do have three minutes to uh, uh, share your comments with the board. Uh, do we have anybody on the line? So, a uh, second call for anybody wanting to provide testimony on item 3B. Third and final call. Seeing nobody come forward, I'll close the hearing. Look to my fellow commissioner for direction. Commissioner French, I move to approve item 3B as presented on today's agenda. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? Seeing none, all of those favors, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Then moving on to 3C, like in Charlie, consider revising Spokane County Traffic Code number 46.61.4155.2. And others, Mr. Zerocor. Thank you, Commissioner French. The next four slides are gonna be regarding traffic speed revisions along the Bigelow Gulch Corridor. Um, this first slide you can see during the process of realigning Bigelow Gulch, there were a couple orphaned pieces of road. That Forker Road on the north or the top of the slide was turned into a dead end road. And obviously it wasn't make sense to have that short section of road be 35 miles an hour. So we're proposing to reduce it to 25. And then at the bottom of the slide, Progress Road that used to be the thoroughfare, you can see is now gonna be a dead end road also. And that one will also be 25 miles per hour. Uh, next slide, please. This is the Forker Interchange with Bigelow Gulch, and this was built a number of years ago, but we're, again, cleaning up county code and codifying that this will be a 25-mile-an-hour interchange, and that's due to obvious reasons. The geometrics require pretty low speeds to navigate the interchange. Uh, next slide, please. This is the one we were talking about earlier, that we're going to actually increase the speed limit on this section of Bigelow Gulch to 45 miles per hour. Again, it's just if you drive it now with the new alignment and the new vertical curve, it seems very, very slow at 35 miles per hour. We did a speed study on this section of road. Average driver speed was actually 50 miles per hour, and national guidance encourages you to keep the posted speed close to what people want to drive the road at as long as it's safe. We've also done intersection analysis at all the intersections to make sure there's adequate sight distance. So as a result of that, we're recommending increasing the speed limit on that section to 45. Uh, next slide, please. And the last in this grouping of traffic code revisions is for the new alignment of Bigelow Gulch, phase six, the portion in the unincorporated county. 
you can see it sweeping down through there and that's going to be 45 miles per hour also and this is a new section of road so it needs to be added to the code and I'll turn it back to you Commissioner French uh, thank you mr. Zirkar so uh, this is a hearing item so I will open up the hearing again uh, you'll have three minutes to provide any testimony uh, if you choose on hearing item 3c like in charter as presented by Mr. Zirikor. If there anybody in the audience like to provide any testimony on 3C, anybody on the phone or Zoom? We do have one individual. Is this by phone or by Zoom? By phone. And yes, I was unable to. This is Richard Burnett again. I was unable to uh, see all of the items on the agenda. Is this the one uh, where it's increasing the speed limit? near the Argon Bigelow Gulch intersection? It is, sir. And again, you have three minutes, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, once again, I uh, think that uh, the uh, speed limit should be remain at 35 from the fire station to well beyond the intersection going uh, east uh, I, because of safety concerns and, uh, and the fire station school and the commercial development there at the intersection. Uh, I tried to get this traffic study and I haven't been able to to uh, obtain it yet and I also have been told by your office that uh, that those in the area were provided flyers but uh, I found nobody uh, that has received any flyers not me and I stopped by the fire station and they were completely unaware of the traffic uh, speed revision nor was the county uh, county fire district 9 so I think that this needs a little bit more study. Thank okay. you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Urquhart, you want to uh, speak to the uh, notice provisions? Yeah, the notice requirement is for posting in the newspaper and also posting on site, and both of those occurred. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, again, any other testimony on hearing item 3C? Third and final call for anybody who wants to provide testimony on 3C. See nobody come forward. Look to my fellow commissioner for direction. Move that we approve item 3C as presented by staff. I'll second the motion. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Then moving on to 3D, like in Delta, consider revising Spokane County Traffic Code number 46.61.2002 at a stop on uh, Nyland Road Y for Spokane County Public Works Department, Mr. Zirikor. Thank you, Commissioner French. This next traffic code revision you can see here is out on the east side of Liberty Lake and it's an uncontrolled intersection currently and it's one of these Y intersections that over time we work to eliminate, but currently this one exists and it was brought to our attention that adequate sight distance does not exist for this to be an uncontrolled intersection for the folks traveling northbound on Nayland. They can't see the lakeside road traffic coming from behind them. So we're proposing to put in a stop sign on Nayland to stop that traffic to make it safe. Okay, any questions? Very good. So this is also a public hearing item and I will open it up for anybody in the audience to look for any testimony on hearing item number 3D, like in Delta. And do we have anybody on the phone or Zoom? Second call for anybody who wants to provide testimony. Third and final call. Seeing nobody come forward, I will close the hearing on 3D and look to my fellow commissioner for direction. I move that we approve item 3D on today's agenda and presented by staff. I will second the motion. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Then moving on to 3E, like an echo, consider revising Spokane County Traffic Code number 46.61.4155.4 at 35 mile an hour on Rodeo Drive for Spokane County Public Works Department, Mr. Zirikor. Thank you again, Commissioner French. Uh, this is on South Barker Road in the Spokane Valley. And you can see the Barker Road on the right side of the slide is the new alignment that was built by a development. And the old portion of Barker Road, now called Rodeo Drive, represented by the red line, 
is not in, currently in code because it didn't exist as that road name before and we're proposing to put a 35 mile an hour speed limit on it. And I'll turn it back to you, Commissioner French. Thank you, sir. Any questions? All right, again, another public hearing item. So I'll open up the hearing for anybody in the audience like providing a testimony on item three, E like an echo. We have anybody on the phone or Zoom? Second call for anybody who want to provide testimony. Third and final call. Seeing nobody come forward, I'm going to close the hearing. Look to my fellow commissioner for direction. Commissioner French, I move that we approve item 3E as presented by staff and on today's agenda. I will second the motion. All those in favor, please indicate me saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Then moving on to 3F, like in Frank, consider revising Spokane County Traffic Code number 46.61.2002 add stop on Sonora Drive and Seabiscuit Drive for the Spokane County Public Works Department, Mr. Zerocor. Thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, this site is out in the Ridgemont area, the Spokane Valley, kind of the southern portion of it, and this is an existing neighborhood. We received a number of citizen complaints about cars driving reckless, recklessly and not slowing down for the uncontrolled intersections. And when we went out and take a look, we found there was <coughs> inadequate sight distance at a number of intersections. And to alleviate that concern for safety, we're going to add some stop signs if this is approved. And the ones that we're proposing to add are on Sonora and Seabiscuit. And the reason we're picking those roads is they have flatter approaches to the intersection, so easier for them to stop and get going. Um, turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Zirakor. Any questions? Again, another exciting public <laughs> hearing item. So <laughs> I will open it up for anybody in the audience to provide any testimony on hearing item 3F. Again, star 9 if you're on the phone or use the raised hand if you're on Zoom. Second call for anybody wanting to provide testimony on 3F. Third and final call. Seeing nobody come forward, going to close the hearing. Look to my fellow commissioner for direction. Commissioner French, I move that we approve item 3F as presented by staff and on today's agenda. I will second the motion. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate you're saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Then getting down to 3G, like in George, consider revising Spokane County Traffic Code number 46.61.4155.4. Remove and add 35 miles per hour on Stoneman Road for the Swickin County Public Works Department, Mr. Zirakor. Thank you, Commissioner French. Sadly, this is the last traffic code revision for the day. Um, appreciate everybody's patience. On this section of Stoneman, we currently have it posted going from 35 to 45 on the very, it'd be the right side of the slide. And it doesn't make a lot of sense because we're having people increase speed right before you get to these two sharp curves. So it just made sense to us to post it down to 35 miles per hour before you get to the sharp curves, and then we'll increase it after that. Okay, any questions? Very good, so this is another hearing item, so I will open it up for anybody in the audience like providing a testimony on hearing item G, and we do have one individual by phone or by Zoom? By Zoom, is that Ms. Larson? So, um, Ms. Larson, uh, you have the floor for three minutes. Uh, please feel okay. free to share. My, yeah, sorry, <laughs> go, ahead. go ahead. My name is Esther Larson and I live uh, in the unincorporated area of Spokane County. I use this particular road when I um, travel with my grandchildren and I wasn't really understanding from the description in the agenda packet what exactly was happening. And I still don't quite understand where is the 45 mile per hour going to begin? If you're starting at the um, underpass of the railroad and you're going east on Stoneman and you go you, there, is it in that area or is it only past Sorrell? Zircor? Um, yeah, happy to answer that question. What we're proposing to do is to 
as people are traveling eastbound and you go under the railroad underpass and then you go through those two 90 degree turns after those we would propose increasing the speed limit to 45 miles per hour keeping a slower speed limit through the curves so it's 35 where mile would that an hour start? It's 35 oh. mile an hour before the double curve, yeah. through the double curve, and then after the double curve, there's where you increase it to 45. Going east. Going east. Yeah, going so west, where? you'll be slowed down before you get to the curves if you're westbound. Right. Correct. So if so, is that east of Morrill and, and Sorrel? I'd have to see a map, Esther. I'm not sure where I'm at. I, I believe okay, Sorrell well, is Morrill, further east. Morrill, Morrill is... Oh, there's Sorrell. Well, you have Sorrell, Sorrell Avenue on here. Right. So we're proposing... Morrill, Morrill is west of Sorrell. My concern is Morrill and that area. Yeah, all the roads that we're talking about, that's going to be 35 miles per hour on Stoneman all through that area. It won't be 45 okay. until you get east of those two sharp curves. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for your assistance on that. I appreciate it, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So anybody else like to provide any testimony on hearing item number 3G? Third and final call for anybody who wanted to provide testimony on 3G. Seeing nobody come forward, I'm going to close the hearing and look to my fellow commissioner for direction. Commissioner French, I move that we approve item 3G as presented by staff and as on today's agenda. I'm going to second the motion. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Then that takes us down to 3H. Uh, consider Newman Lake Flood Control Zone District 2023 Assessment Role for Spokane County Public Works Department. And Mr. Bradabo will give us a presentation on this one. Yeah, thank you, Commissioners. Ben Bradabo, Spokane County Public Works. Uh, an update on the Newman Lake Flood Control Zone District assessments and this is an opportunity for people to provide comments under the Board of Equalization and this is an annual process that determines the assessments that are made to um, collect the budget to operate the flood control zone district. And as previously set, the, the district budget was set, um, the same budget as last year. And so then the assessment is apportioned across the properties. And this is uh, using the new board of appraisers process that was previously approved as well. Um, and so the assessments are changing somewhat for, for the residents at Newman Lake and uh, it, it also incorporates or it retains the use of the assessed value as opposed to um, the discussion of a market value. So it re retains the um, previously used approach. And so um, the assessment rolls have been available. They were noticed in the spokesman review and then available for public comment. This is an opportunity for people to, to make a comment on that. There's a, a brief summary on the next slide. Um, this is an assessment, just a breakdown of how the charges are made by parcel. And then the next slide is a, is a comparison to um, last year's. And so this is largely changed due to the change in the Board of Appraisers process, uh, mostly due to the split parcels was removed. And so there's a change you see to the left side, the low end, um, the, the lower end assessments has increased. There's more than there were previously. And then um, on the far end, there's there are more at a higher end because the split parcels was removed. Um, and so those, those properties are charged more uh, in this proposed assessment. Uh, I think that's it for slides um, and an opportunity for, for people to make comment. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. Bradabo? All right, so this is a uh, public hearing item. It's a uh, 3H. And so I'm gonna go ahead and open a public hearing for anybody in the audience who'd like to provide any testimony on hearing item 3H. Again, if you haven't already filled out one of our nice yellow slips, uh, please feel free to do so. Staff. Uh, and so uh, I'm gonna open up item 3H for anybody in the audience like for any testimony. Do we have anybody on the phone or on Zoom? So second call for anybody who wanna provide testimony 
on 3H, third and final call. Seeing nobody come forward, close the hearing and look to my fellow commissioners for direction. Commissioner French, I move that we approve item 3H, consider the Newman Lake Flood Control District 2023 assessment rolls for Spokane County Public Works Department. I will second the motion. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate saying aye. 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 Let the record effect motion pass unanimously. Thank you. And then um, item 3I uh, is a final hearing to consider uh, the following budget appropriations. Uh, Tessa, you're gonna lead us through this. Thank you, commissioners. Um, very brief, these have all been uh, presented to you. Um, these are just final budget appropriations for the end of the year uh, in the general fund, other funds, and then various grant funds as well. That's it? Wow. You were good. Uh, so this is a hearing item, so anybody would like to provide any uh, comments on uh, budget amendments uh, proposed for the 2023 budget, your, or 22 budget, thank you. Uh, this is the time to uh, come forward and share your comments. So second call for anybody who wants to provide comments. Third and final call. Seeing nobody come forward, I will close the hearing and look to my fellow commissioner for direction. Commissioner French, I move that we approve item 3I, A through U on today's agenda. I will second the motion. Any comments? All right, all in favor, please indicate saying aye. Aye. Aye, let the record effect motion pass unanimously. Then moving on to 3J, uh, this is a resolution of Swickin County, um, Washington, approving a community revitalization financing tax increment um, uh, area agreement. Uh, and we have Mr. Roy Kogan that's going to do a staff report on this. Mr. Kogan. So you are on mute, Mr. Kogan. So the only one that can hear you is you. Uh, <clears throat> uh. I sounded pretty good. Um, yeah. Roy Kogan, public finance consultants. Uh, we have before you a resolution that both calls a public hearing with respect to the formation of a tax increment financing district. And based upon the outcome of that hearing uh, would create the district and approve tax increment agreements with both Bioprotection District Number 9 and Spokane County Light Library District. The proposed district lies north of Hawthorne east of State Route 2, south of Farwell, and west of the North-South Freeway. A notice has been given both by publication and by posting, uh, records of which are on file with the county. Uh, the two taxi districts that participate in this proposed district are Spokane Fire Protection District Number 9. They are required by statute to consent. Uh, their board has done so by resolution and has executed their agreement. Uh, the fire district uh, is not, as in the past, uh, giving up their increment. Uh, and the reason for that is fire districts, unlike other taxing districts, have to vote every one of their taxes. So it's difficult for them to give up a tax on one hand and then ask the voters to approve a tax on another hand. However, the Spokane County Library District has uh, given up their tax. The term of the district is 30 years. The estimated cost of the improvements is not to exceed $25 million. And this is a pay-as-you-go tax increment district. The developers will pay for all the costs of the improvements. And then when and if private development occurs and there is an increase in assessed value, the county would have the option of reimbursing the developer and acquiring those improvements. Any questions? Any questions for Mr. Kogan? So uh, we as a county have entered into these agreements on a number of developments that have occurred 
stretching from the West Plains to uh, uh, Liberty Lake. And uh, they've all been uh, successful in that they have fostered the uh, construction of infrastructure to be able to spur uh, new development that ultimately ends up on the county tax rolls uh, benefiting the general public. Is that a fair statement, Mr. Kogan? Uh, it is a very accurate statement. And I would point out that, that the developer is uh, Mr. Jim Frank, the developer that did uh, the improvements at Liberty Lake and Kendall Yards. Thank you, sir. Uh, so any, any additional presentation or is that it? Uh, no, I am uh, through with my presentation. Okay. So it would be appropriate to open the hearing. Thank you. So this is a hearing item, so I will open up the hearing uh, for anybody who'd like to provide testimony on item 3J, uh, the resolution of Swicken County approving community revitalization uh, financing and tax increment area agreement. Is there anybody in the audience who'd like to provide any testimony on hearing item 3J? Anybody on the phone? Anybody by Zoom? Second call for anybody who wants to provide testimony on 3J. Third and final call. Seeing nobody come forward, I'm gonna close the hearing and look to my fellow commissioner for direction. Commissioner French, I move that we approve item 3J as presented on our agenda and as presented by Mr. Roy Kogan. I will second the motion. Uh, any comment? Uh, so all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passes unanimously. That then gets us to item four, comprehensive plan of public hearing items. We have uh, uh, two items here. Uh, actually, there's three items that we'll, we'll take as a group. Uh, 4A is considered the uh, steering committee of elected officials recommendation on countywide planning policies. Item 4B is consider Planning Commission recommendation on proposed amendment to the Capital Facilities Plan, Chapter 7, of the goals and policies of the Comprehensive Plan in Swicken County Code 13.650. And do you want me to go ahead and list uh, item number 5? Or? You, you, you may move we'll take the public hearing break between those. Okay, so let's just deal with 4A and 4B right now then. Uh, and we do have... Uh, written testimony on 4A and 4B uh, uh, by Tim uh, Trevenovich. He's not here as I bastardized his name, so it's, I think I'm going to get away with that one. Uh, he represents the, he's the attorney for FutureWise, and then Esther Larson. Uh, so those are our uh, written public testimony. So with that, Mr. Chesney, the floor is yours. Commissioner French, Commissioner Kearns, thank you. Uh, Ron, next slide, please. We are going to uh, go through the first two of these um, sequentially. Uh, commissioners, you as participants in the steering committee of elected officials are quite familiar with this first one. Uh, but however, it hasn't uh, had a chance for a public hearing outside of the steering committee. So we're going to run through briefly how these things work. You can see on the first slide what the steering committee is created of, uh, it, and it is a GMA function. Uh, it's also a creature of the county board in that it makes recommendations to you. Next slide. It is made up of uh, 15 uh, voting members. Uh, the commissioners, City of Spokane, the Valley, each of the most of the small towns have one, and then the smaller towns share a representative, and then there are four. Uh, non-voting members, including one at large. Next. The policies uh, have some rules attached to them. Uh, typically, they, excuse me, they should say every five years they've been, uh, they should be looked at. Uh, these have not had it, been cracked open since 2011. Uh, so there's been plenty of time to meet those timelines. And then uh, if anyone chooses or if a member chooses, they can make a recommendation for amendment at any time. Next time, please. Here's how we got here, uh, starting in January, uh, leading to uh, the star at the very end of the arrow. Uh, today is, is the action of the county commissioners to uh, make a recommendation or make a decision based on the recommendation of the steering committee. Next slide. 
Uh, as we said, they're, recommend, they're required by the GMA, and they're a framework that guides the comprehensive planning of the county and all of the constituent communities within it. So they do provide that foundation. Uh, there are nine of these. We will go through them briefly. Next, please. First are the, probably the more recent or the more uh, well-known uh, policy topic one, urban growth areas. These are the areas outside of the incorporated cities where uh, growth happens with the anticipation that those would be annexation candidates for those same communities. Uh, these have not been modified in some time uh, as part of the settlement agreement with FutureWise and the other plaintiffs. Uh, but in the countywide planning policies, we're looking at simplifying how we handle those to give us uh, some flexibility going forward. Next, please. Joint planning uh, is also uh, enshrined in the GMA. <clears throat> it is something that we are, in a sense, kind of restarting with uh, you know, new staff here, some new staff at the city, and trying to bring uh, the, the uh, local incorporated municipalities more into the decision-making process for what's happening in urban growth areas. And you'll see some of that uh, hopefully is going to be getting to be a more robust process as we move forward. As you'll hear just a little bit later, uh, comes into play with the comprehensive plan amendments directly. Next, please. Promotion of contiguous and orderly development. Uh, this is uh, kind of obvious what it says. It's, it, the whole point of GMA is to provide guidance for growth that is affordable from the communities and does not you know, relate to sprawl or things that ultimately become a very expensive thing to maintain. One of the major changes in the countywide planning policies this time is we've removed levels of service and put those into the county's ca uh, capital facilities plan where they're better linked to actual dollars. Policy four, parks and open space. Uh, as you can see here, this is not one of those originally required by GMA, but was added by our predecessors some time ago. Uh, all of the uh, steering committee members felt strongly about keeping it. And so there's been very little change to that. Policy five, transportation. Uh, this one took quite a lot of, uh, detail statements that really didn't seem to be policy statements and pulled those out in favor of uh, helping to define the roles of STA, SRTC, and the county nom uh, nominally in terms of uh, transportation partnerships that move along. Six is siting of uh, capital facilities. Uh, took out redundancies here, made some streamlined changes, no other significant changes here. On seven, this is one that the steering committee uh, deferred to uh, staff for 23, chiefly to seek guidance from commerce and other departments based on recent legislation that was passed that talks about affordable housing and how it is uh, to be distributed. So this one will come back for your review probably in the uh, 23 year. Eight, economic development, again, pretty straightforward, uh, cleaned up. Uh, Redundant language made it more contemporary, uh, keeps the strength of uh, us as an economic development partnership in place. And the last slides, uh, fiscal impacts, we had no recommended changes on this. And a policy topic 10 was introduced, again, as part of a legislative effort to involve tribes in countywide planning. This will be something else that will require some legislative guidance as we create uh, a policy statement for your future consideration. With that, uh, the next slide simply restates that the steering committee recommends these to you unanimously uh, for your adoption. And if you like to, uh, if you have any questions, I'm open to them or I can go on to the CFP. Any questions? Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, continue on with CFP. Very good. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, capital facilities, you can see here, uh, they are the infrastructure needed to support growth. Uh, roads, bridges, sewer, water, those pieces. Uh, the this capital facilities plan is simply the document 
that memorializes those with budget and financing commitments. It is slightly different than a capital improvements program in that GMA requires the capital facilities plan to be linked with our comprehensive plan to guide growth and it is uh, more directed toward that, that, uh, that outcome. And you can see here this most recent decision from the courts uh, how is defining a capital facility in a much more broad sense than we had considered it in the past. That has made the exercise of uh, amending and correcting some of the failures of the CFP much more difficult. Uh, as council has uh, told us in previous work sessions, we continue to seek legislative and uh, Supreme Court relief to try to better make these definitions uh, work for us. You can see here, these are representative of the county-owned facilities that we're talking about, the seven topics. Next slide. And then there are these four that are the special districts. And again, uh, just as a kind of a reminder, the special districts, uh, the county doesn't control them, and yet we are responsible to try to manage that in a capital facilities program, both in terms of their, their actual facility, but their growth, uh, their financing plans for growth, and as you imagine, this is this has to be a better collaborative effort because the uh, the county has it, since they're not departments, the county can't compel them to participate, and most of these do not in and of themselves plan using the GMA framework. So this is this is where things do get a little bit tricky. Next slide, please. Most of this is based on growth, and you can see. Here, the growth numbers from existing and projected uh, population growth in the county. These numbers you will recognize as uh, from uh, the uh, OFM, um, so they're uh, supported numbers that reflect uh, an agreed upon growth rate. The projections and the estimates uh, for these are lower than the county's actual growth, and so you will see some discrepancy as we move forward with comprehensive planning because in the comprehensive planning, we're, we're looking at actual, the real numbers for 21, 22, but for the planning purposes of the CFP, uh, and remember, this is, this is a document that's being amended from a 2017 version in a 2020 version, so we're using numbers more contemporary to that time frame. Next slide, please. Here's where you can start to see the levels of service being defined in this area. Uh, you can see for uh, you know, system capacity for wastewater, for example, 200 gallons a day. Uh, transportation levels of service are well understood by uh, all of us and, and certainly my colleague Matt, uh, who's just here. And then law enforcement, and you'll notice on the left, this includes the uh, detention and diversion beds that were recently created. And that was a term agreed to uh, by the settlement partners to add that in as a level of service. Next slide, please. Here's where we get a little more uh, out of control of what we're doing, but uh, to some degree, we have used existing data from schools if they were uh, able to provide that for us. We used some national data, uh, some, well ex some more uh, established standards to try to bring these numbers together. Fire districts, uh, as you can probably guess, trying to shoehorn a fire district into something that has a capacity uh, is not a well-defined term. We chose to rely on their insurance ratings, which have to take their ability to respond, what kind of apparatus they use, how, what kind of training they use, and use that as a benchmark standard. Uh, next, please. And while this is hard to read, uh, it's more of an example, this is the six-year version of that by a uh, major element and also you can see in the second column by a, uh, a variety of funding sources that are used for these. Uh, as uh, you know, the first column, 2023, is pretty much the only guaranteed number. That's the budget that uh, you've worked through for this year. The others are projections from various departments on what they're going to need based on typical funding sources that it can be relied on. Next. The 20-year projections uh, 
are, uh, as, as with all kind of crystal ball gazing, they are sketchier. Uh, they are made on best estimates of uh, likely available funding sources as well as long-term needs from these capital departments, uh, from you know, solid waste, water, reclamation, uh, and including public health, for example. Next. The second element of capital facilities planning is Chapter 7 of the Comprehensive Plan, and that is part of the package before you for uh, approval today. And what we're doing here is simply making sure that Chapter 7 is in conformance with the CFP document itself and making any attendant changes to do that. Next, please. And then the final piece uh, for uh, this is uh, uh, Spokane Code 13.650, which talks about concurrency. And concurrency is a GMA term that relates to when uh, certain things have to be available for development. With the direct concurrency, you can see these are things that must be in place at the time that a, essentially a building permit is applied for. Indirect is more on the planning side. We've made some recommended changes here uh, that uh, for fire protection schools and stormwater, adding them into direct concurrency means those will be looked at more, more uh, connected to actual projects when they come along. And we've also dropped, uh, dropped those from the indirect side so they're better tied to, as I said, tied to building permits. So uh, we've got a number of comments that came to us uh, from the public. We've included a, a list of them here, uh, mostly for kind of a quick review. Uh, some of these came from uh, the group FutureWise, some of them came from the Department of Commerce. These and any comments are also posted on the web uh, in the pages where these are available for other review. Uh, we have addressed most of the comments that have been asked of us. Uh, sometimes not always to the degree of detail that, that people are demanding. Again, you can see that forecast of future needs for schools. Uh, what we did with that was to, rather than try to uh, ask for a capital plan, we asked the school districts, fire districts, in mostly letter form to give us a description of how they intend to grow and where they think they're going to have to grow. And that is part of uh, Appendix D in the final overall package. Uh, you, next slide, please. Oh, you got it. Um, some of these were uh, kind of review functions. Um, Department of Commerce was very helpful in pointing out some issues where the numbers didn't actually align. Uh, and again, as you can certainly guess, working with uh, lots of different tabular data over time, it's not surprising that some of the numbers didn't jibe in their first go around, but we've made those corrections. And the last slide then here. This is uh, the Planning Commission's recommendation. They voted unanimously on November 17th to recommend approval of the amendment as it was posted with these following amendments, and these have been uh, added and, and worked on since uh, the Planning Commission made that happen, and that is the document that is now before you today. And with that, uh, Commissioner French, uh, I would stop and offer a chance for the public. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions for Mr. Chesney? Okay. So, uh, as uh, Mr. Chesney has indicated and is in our agenda, this is a uh, public hearing uh, topic. So, I am going to uh, allow testimony uh, on both 4A and 4B at the same time. And uh, before starting, I will uh, reiterate again that we do have a written testimony provided by T uh, Trim, Tim Drahimovich from FutureWise and Esther Larson on uh, 4A and 4B. And I do have a yellow slip from a Mr. Paul Kropp wanting to provide testimony on item 4B. Is he? joining us. So, Mr. Kropp, you uh, welcome and you have uh, three minutes, sir. Are you there? You're muted. 
Testimony is riveting. Okay, we will try and come back to Mr. Crop. Uh, so, uh, is there anybody else? What is he? Oh, um, Ms. Larson, um, you'll be next, uh, and you have three minutes. Go ahead. Yes. Well, you have received my written documents. Yes. And having heard the testimony uh, or the presentation from Mr. Chesney. I would like to know whether or not there is still an opportunity to amend the countywide planning policies following final uh, action on the FutureWise Spokane County Hearing Board case that was at the Court of Appeals. Yes or no? <laughs> so um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm asking the question. <laughs> I'm asking the question. The, the action, I'm not sure I understand the question directly. The action that the board is being asked to consider today is to adopt an amendment to the countywide planning policies, straightforward, uh, you know, a vote on that. This, the remaining pieces that could still be part of you know, the, the uh, topic number seven, housing, for example, they don't have to wait five years. They can be brought up by any steering committee member next year with a recommendation to consider those. So there's, there's sort of a living side of this document right now, but this action is, is simply a straightforward uh, amendment request in front of the commissioners. It's not related to any, any litigation. Has the litigation at the Court of Appeals been finalized? Or is it still pending? The mandate has not been issued in the Court of Appeals case and will be filing an appeal to the Supreme Court. So until the mandate issues from that is still pending. Okay, thank you. The reason I asked that question is I raised that issue at uh, the public hearing in October on the countywide planning policies and Mr. French asked Mr. Chesney whether or not uh, there would be an ability to have amendments to the countywide planning policies after that particular case had been finalized and Mr. Chesney said, yes, there would be. So I understand that is still the case. Is that true? Yes, that's still the case. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, my other two comments have to do with the fact that the countywide planning policies in two areas are not using words of the statute. And I have mentioned this several times and there's not been any change, no, nor has there been any response to me regarding those two items. And I believe that the words that are actually in the statute, in the Growth Management Act, as law should be used, not other words. Landlords are not local areas. Landlords are limited areas. Development patterns that can be uh, reviewed or actually shall be reviewed for urban growth area consideration are occurring, not some that may emerge. And so I believe those two things need to be changed. Last, I do agree with the comments of FutureWise and support FutureWise's uh, documentation that has been submitted throughout these procedures involving the countywide planning policies. The most serious issue that I have is that the public participation process for this particular item for countywide public policies as outlined in my comments and the attachments is not public participation. Even the public hearing notice I was not able to locate and if one is not a subscriber to the spokesman review, you have to pay to even see that public hearing notice. So there needs to be something that is really public participation that is in that is consistent with your most recent policies adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Uh, Mr. Kropp, uh, I see that you're not muted anymore. You've got three minutes, sir. Are you there, Mr. Kropp? Okay. Evidently, technology is not our friend so far. So I will open it up to anybody in the audience until we can 
uh, be able to pull Mr. Crop up to uh, provide testimony. Uh, Mr. Greg Fig. Oh, good afternoon, uh, commissioners. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I, in an email I had with uh, Mr. Chesney, I was just wondering if those uh, WASHDOT comments got included. Um, yes, Greg, they did. Thank you. Nothing further, but thank you. Thank you. So I will open it up to anybody in the audience who'd like to provide any testimony on hearing items 4A or 4B as presented today. And Mr. Paul Kropp, are you able to join us? Okay. Second call for anybody who wanted to provide testimony on 4A or 4B. Third and final call for anybody who wanted to provide testimony on 4A or 4B. All right, seeing nobody come forward, um, I will close the hearing on 4A and 4B. And then um, you wanted to uh, provide um, presentation on item 5A at this point as well? Yes, Commissioner. Your floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Commissioner French. One more. Uh, we're going to go through the uh, comprehensive plan amendments uh, as they were presented to us. Uh, you, of course, have seen these a couple of times. Uh, first time was to consider initiating them for action and then the Planning Commission process has proceeded to get them back to you for recommendation. You can see, generally speaking here, um, what GMA and comprehensive planning is. Uh, next slide, please. There's several goals that we take into account on these, uh, namely you know, urban growth itself, reduced sprawl, transportation, housing, economic development, citizen participation, and public facilities and services. Next, I'm sorry, next slide, Ron. Uh, these are all in the GMA, and they're uh, essentially evaluating steps that are used for the project. Next. Here you can see the location of the uh, comprehensive plan amendments that were proposed for the year. Uh, three on the north side on essentially the uh, Farwell, <coughs> Hastings Farwell Corridor, three on the West Plains, and two uh, kind of scattered in the northeast part just outside of the city of Spokane itself. Of these uh, important point, there were nine submitted uh, for consideration. One was ineligible uh, it, because it, it was proposing ex expansion of uh, a Lamard, which was just mentioned by uh, Ms. Hansen. And by that settlement agreement at the moment, Spokane County is not allowed to consider expanding those areas of uh, rural development, which we call rural activity centers. Uh, these were uh, heard by the Planning Commission on October 27th and November 17th for consideration and recommendation to you. Next slide. These are the eight remaining uh, amendments. Uh, you can see they vary in size from uh, an acre and a half up to 108 acres. Uh, you can also see the general locations here. Most of these are moving from uh, either a low density residential or a light industrial into some residential use and a couple of them to a mixed use or a regional commercial designation. Next. One of the uh, things that we did differently this year is when these were initially submitted, uh, we held a series of previews with the City of Spokane, with uh, STA, with WashDOT to get an initial assessment of uh, any major omissions or any major flaws or for that matter studies that they thought might be coming on forward. This was before uh, any consideration of them and it turns out uh, this was a very well received process and it's something that's now been uh, put back into code that we will use on a cons constant basis. Next slide. No, got it. Uh, the formal part, you've, you've certainly seen before, um, getting those comments from reviewing agencies that we work with. Uh, these were looked and balanced, and again, the reason we're doing this all in one 
set of uh, hearings for you today is they all have to be in conformance with each other. So these were balanced against that emerging capital facilities plan. And then just kind of reminder here that now uh, water, wastewater, and these are direct concurrency services that will be evaluated in more detail as these become project uh, oriented actions and not just land actions. Next slide, please. Yeah. This is uh, essentially the cumulative impact that if these were to go forward with some basic assumptions on how they would develop. And we will summarize those assumptions at the end. But you can see it, it makes for a slight increase of, of all of our major uh, capital issues into the law enforcement, uh, parks, schools, wastewater, water consumption. And they're uh, relatively modest. They're, there's nothing in there that's uh, an outrageous uh, impact. And these are levels of service that are within the limits set by the CFP. Thanks. Here is the chronology of how we got to today. Uh, you can see starting a year ago uh, with their uh, initiation or with their uh, uh, submittals to us, uh, the preview is listed in there, the various coordinating agencies leading up to November 17th and the Planning Commission's final action. Now we'll go through them uh, as a group. We're going to treat the first three uh, on the Hastings Farwell Corridor as a group. Uh, they're, they're all pretty much in that area. You can see uh, Hastings Road, the diagonal, um, Newport Highway, uh, and the uh, future mixed-use project. Uh, Costco is at the lower part of the screen, for example. So uh, plan amendment one, four, and five. Next. <coughs> amendment one. Uh, low density to higher density residential on four acres in the North Metro. Uh, issues that were brought up, chiefly schools, traffic, water. Next. Similar low density to high density on six and a half acres. Uh, uh, very similar concerns brought up. Next, please. And then the smaller one, acre and a half, uh, all of these in place. Next. The analysis shows they're all uh, either on or, or adjacent to a principal arterial, so they have some pedestrian infrastructure. There are commercial uses in proximity to these, which is important uh, for any higher density residential classification to have access to those things. Uh, we noted that this is going to be in both the Division Connects study as well as the un upcoming STA study for uh, intermodal and multimodal uh, development. And they fit. Uh, at least these three of these six zoning criteria that are necessary for them to be moved forward as an amendment. Uh, it's consistent with the comprehensive plan, uh, changes in economic conditions, and uh, deemed necessary by the commission as in the public interest. Next slide. Comments, uh, again, uh, traffic, pedestrians, building heights, uh, which are, are, are 35, not 50, uh, and stormwater was a big issue. They had, the residents noted that there was frequent street flooding uh, in the area and were concerned that more impervious surface would make that worse. Uh, our public works folks took a look at that and found that they had started making some improvements already and have some further improvements already programmed for the next year or two. So uh, they are uh, well underway to sol solving that. And Mead schools confirmed that there was capacity for their schools. On the West Plains, we have three, uh, again, from relatively small to the largest of these at 108 acres, uh, CPA number two, uh, all in the light industrial area south of I-90. Uh, and you'll see as we go on uh, how they evolved. Next one. CPA02, uh, 108 acres, uh, uh, Thorpe Road on the side immediately adjacent to I-90, some continuing light industrial areas to its east and west, uh, residential beyond that to the east, and large lot or five acre uh, uh, large lot projects to the south. This is going from light industrial to a mixed use category. Uh, that provides uh, quite a lot of both flexibility 
and concern uh, because there are not a lot of direct parameters on what that means. The mixed use is allowed to be thought of in a, in a different, uh, more flexible configuration. Uh, you can see also there are some navigation issues because of proximity to the airport. Uh, there are some prohibitions on the southern part of this potential site that do not allow residential uh, development whatsoever. Next. <coughs> Here's kind of a summary. The, uh, with any project like this, uh, the size of this is daunting. Uh, it, it looks at things and, and you can see the uh, the roads need to be improved, the water and wastewater needs to be improved because they weren't thought of or, or considered at this scale at the time. That is absolutely typical of land planning and development. Uh, while this is in an urban growth area, uh, in, at a light industrial level you make certain assumptions and then at a mixed use level you'll have to adjust those assumptions as you go along. It meets the same three zoning criteria as the others. And these will be a little harder to see on the screen, but we've summarized uh, the uh, public comments that we've received, and notably, uh, right on top, the concerns by the adjacent business owners that this would uh, significantly uh, hinder their operation by providing uh, housing in an area that was not originally planned for it, and therefore the presumption is the housing and the residents would be complaining about industrial noise, vibration, light, uh, and so on. Our response to that is it is in a mixed use category, you really have more flexibility on how you can design and, and mitigate those issues. Now we, we say that advisedly because there is no development plan. And one of the things that uh, others have considered on this is, is whether or not there should be additional guidance in our plan documents for mixed use that, uh, that uh, suggest you have to provide a set of uh, operating issues or some more detail on how that mixed use is being planned. The, there was a suggestion of a regulatory taking uh, and that was in the sense that if a residential if a truly residential use was uh, adopted next to this and the business, a business needed to expand, some of the residential setback requirements do come into effect. However, um, our code, while residential is part of mixed use, our code and our plan don't actually recognize, don't consider mixed use as a residential zone. That said, uh, the takings is generally considered if you lose some or all of your economic use of the land. In this case, that really doesn't happen uh, because the, the practical part is the, if the setbacks were even imposed, you can still use those lands for parking, for stormwater, uh, for circulation, and notably on industrial um, construction, fire districts really prefer having four-sided or, or full-side full -side access to these buildings. So you typically even leave open a lane all the way around them to begin with. So that, that, that doesn't really play into account. The criteria for mixed use uh, were suggested had not been met. We, su we suggest that the uh, development does serve the public interest uh, because it does continue to bring potential housing and jobs into the uh, category. And uh, something else, the uh, the land was zoned in 94 in its current configuration and so it has been a good, you know, quite a number of years uh, where nothing has happened out there and when you start to look at comprehensive plans and they have a 20-year horizon, if you're not seeing something happen in that 20-year horizon, you, it may be time to be reevaluating re it in any case and that's what's happened out on the West Plains over the last you know, five years with, with incremental pieces of residential specifically coming in there. Uh, the idea that this is spot zoning is uh, not uh, supported uh, out of several reasons. One, it's, it's quite a large uh, parcel in and of itself. Uh, it doesn't necessarily change the nature of the use entirely away. You could still have quite a lot of light industrial 
small business activity within the mixed use site. Next. The city uh, of Spokane, which is the water and sewer provider uh, in this area, uh, had uh, concerns uh, and had, some, had significant concerns when it was projected that there was a, a huge amount of people on this and that 6,000 persons was done by the engineer to illustrate more of a maximum of what could be on the site at any one time, including parks, stores, small businesses, and residential. And that was driven to some degree by the airport's uh, navigation easements of only so many persons per acre. When you break down the residential side of this, uh, it's far less people, and the city's comment was more along the lines of, yes, uh, some pieces of infrastructure are not sized for this. They will have to be replaced sooner than expected. Uh, again, those are fairly typical development terms, and a developer would be used to, uh, as a mitigation step, uh, say, okay, I'm going to have to put a bigger pipe in. I'm going to have to make a change in here. At this stage, the city did not ask for any specific mitigation steps. Next, transportation. Uh, this was a, a coordinated group that got together, uh, which was actually very effective, and they looked at, at how uh, the basic issues of the project could go forward and reached a mitigated de or determination of mitigated circumstance. I'm sorry, mitigated, <laughs> mitigated determination. And those mitigations are in the staff report. Uh, we put up a kind of an exercise to show something in, and more for comparison than anything else. In the mixed use zone, development intensities are not just units per acre or setbacks. Uh, and they're done with floor area ratios. They're done with other planning tools. And while uh, it was not anticipated that this would be fully developed in, in residential, if you were to do so using the tools that are available, it would hold uh, about 3,000 dwelling units. If it was done to a very more typical multifamily development that you see around Spokane County at 24 units an acre, it would hold about 1,800 and the applicant is planning for about 1,700. So the, the impacts that are being anticipated are well within the, the code and, and uh, development criteria that the city and the county have in place. Next. Moving on uh, to number six, a smaller project uh, adjacent to a school, and it is going into a residential use. What you can see, can, can you go back one more run? Uh, here's, this is very characteristic of what we've seen in the West Plains in the last several years. You can see the site proposed outline in red, uh, the school to the east of that, which is in its own light industrial category, and to the north, uh, a subdivision that was platted when housing was directly allowed in light industrial lands. And so while uh, there has been some concern that light industrial is not appropriate for this, there's also quite a few of these on the West Plains where residents were established during a different time. And so this is not so out of place as we've seen. Go ahead. Uh, light industrial to, to MDR makes a lot of sense you know, next to a school on tra tra possible traffic. And then the last one on the West Plains, again, you can still see that pattern of residential platting in the light industrial areas. So these are uh, amendments that, uh, in a way, uh, much like the county engineer was talking about codifying some traffic improvements that have been in place and, and for some time. In a way, this is starting to do that same thing. We're starting to look at uh, changing the, the actual comp plan that is in an emerging residential area to begin with. Go ahead. <clears throat> Nothing uh, out of the ordinary here. One more. The analysis on both of these, uh, you know, they're, they're both on the arterial network. Uh, they've got commercial uses nearby. The traffic were acceptable. Cheney schools indicated there was capacity. 
and they meet three of the zoning criteria. Next. Two more to go. Uh, number eight is in Hilliard. You'll recognize this is this city's water tank on Valley Springs Road going up to the Beacon Hill project just off side of the industrial parts of Hilliard in the city. Uh, it was proposed that this small part of light industrial land really was not feasible for industrial use, but better suited to the residential use that is existing and planned to the south. Uh, this is a split project. The applicant controls the north and south parcel. Uh, the city of Spokane owns the middle parcel. The city uh, did not uh, participate in the application. Uh, they simply said they would not object to it with certain conditions that you'll see here in a moment. Three acres, medium density residential, and the city wants to be able to protect its water tank by that lot. Go on. Uh, it, it meets these three zoning criteria. Uh, it does have uh, some emerging residential to the south. One more. And Spokane's comments are generally related to uh, development impacts on that project if it were to uh, develop and wanting to protect, protect their interest in their middle parcel, uh, chiefly as uh, I think you'd have to see, assume as an uh, overflow route if something were to happen to that uh, re reservoir tank up above it on the hill. Next. Uh, CPA 7 is in the heavy industrial area north of the former uh, Hanson property, south of Bonneville Power. The North Spokane Corridor is just to the east of this. Uh, the city of Spokane is off to the west a little bit. This was proposed to go to regional commercial from heavy industry. Uh, it's 45 acres. Uh, next, please. You can see some of the issues here. In parts, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but the concern uh, on the following slide talks about uh, should industrial, should heavy industrial land be converted to some other use? Um, this board uh, initiated this with the sense of uh, we have not seen any investment in there in a long time. Someone is willing to invest in it and they're fitting, filling our needs, we should consider it. Uh, it was processed in that capacity. Uh, it, the, the economy and some things changed during that process and the uh, planning commission voted to deny this particular project. Go on, please. The comments were here uh, that it would be lost. And uh, as we've noted in the briefing, uh, the, the a new property owner for the Hanson property came forward at the public hearing and announced they were uh, reestablishing a steel fabrication and manufacturing business on that site and uh, have purchased the property and pushed forward. Wrapping up uh, the cumulative impacts, these are the assumptions we used to reach uh, what you'll see again uh, repeated on the following slide. But it's a range of, of units per acre of capacities. They're pretty standard based on development patterns that exist in Spokane County. Go ahead. And this is just a refresher slide uh, before that these amendments on, based on the assumptions on that previous slide, uh, these amendments could provide as much as 2,000 units of housing for you know, around 3,000 people uh, with the expected water uses. So, one more. Again, there's the pattern. And then the last slide uh, is the recommendation. The Planning Commission voted unanimously uh, on November 17th to recommend the approval of amendments 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 9. Remember, plan amendment number three was not considered early on, and then the plan commission voted five to one to recommend denial of 07. Commissioner French, that is the presentation and summary of where we stand. Thank you, Mr. Chesney. Uh, any questions for Mr. Chesney? Okay. So at this time, I will open up Oh, this is not a public hearing for, for these items. So, um, 
in, in that we've already taken public testimony on 4A and 4B. Uh, I'm now looking to my fellow commissioner for direction. Commissioner French, I move that the board adopt the proposed amendments to the countywide planning policies, capital facilities plan, chapter seven of the comprehensive plan, Spokane County code 13.650, and proposed concurrent amendments to the comprehensive plan and zoning maps for file number CPA 14568 and nine as presented by staff and, and in accordance with the recommendations of the steering committee of elected officials and planning commission. And we remand files CPA 02 and CPA 07 to the planning commission to be considered further during the 2023 comprehensive plan amendment cycle. Thank you, I will second the motion. Any additional comments? All right. So with that then, uh, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record, let, let the record reflect the motion passes unanimously then. Then uh, Commissioner French, I move that the board directs staff to draft findings and conclusions consistent with the board's decision today to be signed at other than an open public meeting by the chair or a majority of the board before December 31st, 2022. I will second the motion. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passes unanimously. Then we do have uh, four by leave items for consideration of the board. Uh, I have by leave item number seven is a resolution to certify Spokane County Assessor uh, the amount of taxes levied in 2022 to be collected in 2023 upon the property in Spokane County for county purposes from the general fund, road fund, and conservation futures, adding certification language required by the Department of Revenue Property Tax Advisory, PTA, PTA 21.1.2021 to resolution number 22-0795. Look to my fellow commissioner for direction. Yeah. Commissioner French, I move to approve by leave item number seven as you stated. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a motion on the floor and then we'll take public hearing. And I will second the motion. And so since this is a by leave item, it is open to uh, the public for anybody who wants to provide any comment on uh, by leave item number seven as read. Second one, uh, wanting to provide any comment on by leave number seven. Third and final call, seeing nobody run to the microphone. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing and uh, call for the vote. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Then, by leave item number eight, resolution in the matter of an appointment to the Spokane County Citizens Commission on salaries to fill the vacancy created by the end of term of the organized labor representative. Mr. French, I move to approve uh, by leave item number eight of the resolution as stated. I will second the motion. Again, this is a uh, by leave item, so there, uh, it is open for public testimony. Anybody in the audience would like to provide any testimony on uh, resolution number eight by leave? Um, please come forward. Second call for anybody who want to provide testimony. Third and final call, seeing nobody come forward. Um, look to my fellow commissioner for direction. Did you already make a motion? I didn't. Well, look at you, ahead of the game. Uh, then, all in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Then, by leave item number nine, a resolution relating to the funding of a Vista Stadium improvements. And I'm going to read into the record the motion, if that's all right with my fellow commissioner. This is uh, resolution number, by leave resolution number nine. Spokane County commits to invest up to $8 million toward the renovations of a Vista Stadium in accordance with the requirements of the Major League Baseball 
and pre-identified spectator improvements as identified by the Spokane Indians ownership. The county commitment is a dollar for dollar match to the community's investment, not excluding, or excluding uh, state capital funds. This commitment to the Spokane Indians ownership is contingent upon a successful lease negotiation with the Spokane Indians. Said lease shall have at a minimum the Spokane Indians paying for all annual maintenance of the facility and an annual minimum rent of $100,000. The lease shall also require that the Spokane Indians pay a percentage of gross revenues to the county starting in March of 2025. Gross revenues shall include ticket sales, sponsorships, concessions, merchandise, and promotional goods to include apparel items. So, uh, Commissioner French, I will make a motion um, to reflect the statement that you just read. Thank you, sir. Got a motion and a sec, or well, you're gonna make the motion, I'll second the motion. Okay. So we've got a motion and a second. Uh, again, this is a by leave item, so anybody in the audience would like to provide any testimony on the motion before the board, this is the time to come forward. Second call for anybody when to provide testimony. Third and final call for anybody when to provide testimony. I will close the um, uh, testimony and uh, look to my fellow commissioners. You would like to, would you like to provide any comment on this? So I will. Uh, as everybody, well, as, as a lot of folks are aware, uh, the Major League Baseball uh, has uh, 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 changed its structure and uh, changed uh, requirements or increased requirements on local communities to be able to continue to have a minor league baseball team located within their community. And um, as a result of that uh, change, uh, Spokane Indians are confronted with uh, uh, the challenge of investing $22 million to improvements to the Vista Stadium. Uh, those improvements uh, include improvements to meet the minimum requirements for uh, Major League Baseball uh, but then also in this situation include uh, amenities for spectators to make the uh, facility uh, more uh, customer friendly, if you will. Uh, the uh, funds that are being uh, identified in this are coming from the sale of two assets uh, the county uh, previously owned. One of those assets was Spokane Raceway out in West Plains and the other asset that's been disposed of was uh, uh, the 8th Avenue office building. Uh, the total revenue generated from those two sales came to approximately $8.6 million. Eight million of that uh, is being proposed uh, for uh, reinvestment into a Vista Stadium. So this investment does not require an increase in taxes to our taxpayers. It is merely disposing of assets that were underperforming and reinvesting those dollars into assets the county will continue to own and enjoy the uh, benefit of. So um, this motion is being put forward uh, so that the uh, Spokane Indians can go to the state legislature and um, request funding from the state to invest in this facility. I think the last number I heard was 5.8 million. And uh, then it puts the uh, burden for uh, collecting the rest of the revenue onto the community partners. So if in fact the community partners can raise the balance of the funding um, and if uh, that uh, entails a one-to-one -one match from the county. If, for instance, the, 
the community can only raise six million dollars, then that's all that the county is is committing to fund is six million dollars. Um, but if the community raises ten million dollars, the cap for the county is eight million dollars. Again, it's redeploying revenue from the sale of assets uh, to reinvest into an asset the county taxpayers own, and that's a Vista Stadium. So. That's the proposal before uh, the board. And um, did I already call for public testimony on this? So I will now open it up for anybody in the audience who would like to provide any testimony on um, this resolution. Second call for anybody who wants to provide testimony on resolution number nine. Third and final call. Seeing nobody come forward, I'll close the uh, testimony and uh, uh, ask all those in favor of the resolution, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Then the last by leave item we have, and appreciate that there's no cheering or applause for that, uh, is uh, uh, by leave item number 10. Uh, yesterday, the Board of County Commissioners, uh, to include our two new commissioners, uh, uh, did assignments, proposed assignments, for boards and commissions for uh, 2023. Uh, this is something we do every year so that there is a clear understanding about which commissioners are going to sit on which boards uh, in the community. So, so um, this was done in an open meeting yesterday, um, but uh, we have to adopt this before the year end, and this will be the last hearing, or the last meeting of the Board of County Commissioners before year end, so it has to be done uh, today so that the other boards and commissions in the community know who their membership is going to be starting on January 1. So I'm going to ask our legal, do you want me to read this into the record? No, I don't think it's necessary to read in the record. Gina has it for the, for the record. Thank you. That was the right answer. No. Um, so um, well, I'm, just for the benefit of the public, um, the committees that we're talking about are Aging and Long-Term Care of Eastern Washington, the Airport Board, Broadband PDA, Canvassing Board, uh, Fair Board, Finance Committee, Forward Fairchild, Growth Management Steering Committee, Greater Spokane Incorporated Board, Health Board, Hutton Settlement Advisor, Industrial Development Corporation, Launch Northwest, Law Enforcement and Firefighters Disability Board, Law Library, Lodging Tax Advisory Committee, Martin Hall Consortium, Medical Examiner Advisory Council, Northwest or Northeast PDA, Priority Spokane, uh, Rail Consortium, Solid Waste Advisory Committee, Spokane County Campus Security Committee, Spokane County Regional Interlocal Leadership Structure, Spokane Regional Clean Air Agency, Spokane Regional Law and Justice Legislative Policy Committee, Spokane Regional Transportation Council, SDA Board of Directors, Impact Mitigation Fund with the Spokane Tribe, Tourism Promotion Area Board, University District Public Development Authority, and Valley Chamber of Commerce. Oh no, there's more. Visit Spokane, Wastewater Policy Advisory Board, West Plains Public Development Authority, Workforce Development Council, Workforce Development Consortium, Washington State Association of Counties. Um, those are all Commissioner Kearns' committees. No, I'm just kidding. No, those committees have been allocated to the five commissioners in a, in a, a cooperative way uh, yesterday. And uh, I think we reached 
consensus as of yesterday. So uh, the last remaining challenge is to go ahead and adopt this. So Commissioner Kearns. Yeah, Commissioner French, I um, move that we, so that there, there's one on here that, that is still not, not yet assigned, the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee. So I would move that we add Commissioner Cuny to fill the role on the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee and adopt the list uh, as presented. I will second the motion. All those in favor, please indicate. Uh, oh, did I do the testimony? I do, okay. Uh, anybody in the audience would like to provide any testimony on the boards and commissions uh, appointments? This is unique. We, uh, in the past, uh, this is more house cleaning for the board and is typically not open to public comment, but because we've had to add it as a by leave and uh, uh, there was not uh, public notice about it, we do provide the public with the opportunity to provide testimony now. So uh, is there anybody who wants to provide testimony on this, please uh, indicate by coming forward and or raising your hand on Zoom or uh, dialing star nine. And I see that we have Esther Larson. Ms. Larson, you've got three minutes. Is this particular document, when it's been finalized, able to be put on the uh, county board of commissioners webpage someplace so the public might be able to address concerns with respect to those particular agencies or entities to the particular commissioner that is sitting on that board? Uh, uh, my uh, executive is saying yes, and so yes, it will be posted on our county boards and commissions uh, website. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, third and final call for anybody wanting to provide testimony on the board and committee assignments as presented. Seeing nobody else come forward, I will close uh, the testimony and we already have a motion and a second. So all those in favor, please indicate saying aye. 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 Opposed nay, the ayes have it. That completes all the business uh, coming before the board unless Mr. Simmons, you have anything uh, else for our consideration or Mr. McLean, you have anything for executive session? I have nothing further, Commissioner. I have nothing further also. Got two right answers. Thank you very much, sir, sirs. And so that completes all the business coming before the board and it is now um, uh, 3.55 uh, and we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.